So this is Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 40. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realised that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison door open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the orders, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. And Margaret, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, shall we pray? Yeah. Father, thank you uh, for your word and thank you for Margaret. Thank you for the word that you put on her heart to share with us. And I pray that you would just open our minds and our hearts to hear what you've got to say to us this morning. And may Margaret receive a blessing as she blesses us and i pray this in jesus name amen do i have to wait for you to check? no it's going okay. lovely so paul and silas on their way to philippi attract the attention of this female slave who then ceaselessly follows them for days 
The female slave girl has an evil spirit, which has earned her the reputation of being a fortune teller and made lots of money for her owners. She's actually shouting the truth, but will likely have done so in this strange voice, according to the traditions of the time, dangerously associating the God whom Paul and Silas proclaim with the pagan and mythological deities. Luke describes her as having a spirit of divination, but the word Luke uses to describe her spirit literally means python, a snake, but particularly the snake that would have been so familiar from Greek mythology that protected Gaia, the mother of the gods, and was killed by Apollo. Although she is speaking the truth, Paul and Silas will have been keen not to be associated with this evil spirit and the pagan trappings of her skills. Paul becomes annoyed by her incessant sinister presence and shouting. And so, rather than sending her away, Paul recognises her humanity. The humanity that comes from being made in the image of God. And he heals the slave girl. His annoyance was aimed at the spirit, not the girl herself. Paul's frustration, which could so easily have led to anger and unkindness, instead leads to compassion, and the girl's life is changed forever. However, this dramatic change means that the slave girl's owners lose their income, and therefore they contrive to have Paul and Silas face the authorities and then end up in jail. This is hypocrisy as they accuse them of promoting customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice, even though they themselves were profiteering from this slave girl and her paganistic ways. It is also, of course, an injustice. The accusers emphasise that Paul and Silas are Jews, conveniently ignoring the fact, or not listening to the fact, that they are also Roman citizens. This is classic use of a technique of othering or labelling others as something different from ourselves, using a convenient label to mark people out as different from us and something unpopular and something not as good as ourselves, not, not like ourselves. They insinuate that it's Paul and Silas's Jewishness that is creating uproar in our city. Again, othering, as they insinuate that the city belongs to them and that Paul and Silas, as Jews, are outsiders and have no right or welcome to be there. The Jews, even whilst a number of them were also Roman citizens, were unpopular as they had their own distinct beliefs and ways of life, which sometimes ran counter to Roman culture and sometimes challenged Roman culture and tradition. I'm struck that the more and more we investigate the lives and situations of those in the early church, the more and more we find similarities with our own context, even though it's 2,000 years ago in a very different place. How often do we find people othering groups of people by ascribing a label which then carries so much stereotyping and assumptions? Over the last week, I've been reading some articles about a group of travelling folk in the North Somerset and Bristol area moving from place to place. And so often these groups are quickly judged and efforts are made to move them on within minutes of arriving in the place. But it's been really interesting to read this particular article about this particular group who are welcoming people who pass by, whose animals are well cared for, who are allowing the children to come and pat their animals without any fear or risk of being bitten or anything else. And then they're moving on when they're asked and leaving the place immaculate clean and it's been really interesting on the comment section to read comment after comment after comment witnessing this completely contrary to the stereotypes that that particular label carries with it it's so important to see beyond labels and to recognize people as individuals with their own stories experiences and behaviors just as we're not all the same simply because we are part of the Chilino Baptist Network you have to watch out for those Baptists, you know. They all wear bobble hats and spend all their time hiking. <laughs> I know that was, a, that was a jokey, so when I grew up, I didn't grow up as a Baptist, and that was a jokey stereotype that was banded around. Although I've not been around long, I've been here enough to know that each village within the Chuinyo Valleys has its own distinctiveness, as do each of the individuals within each of those villages. 
We cannot afford to make assumptions based on geography or labels. In Paul and Silas's case, this emphasis on their Jewishness overwrites and overshadows the fact they are also Roman citizens with the same status as their accusers. Roman citizens were not supposed to practice foreign cults, although what individuals did was not closely scrutinised unless or until impacted others. Again, how closely this actually resonates with contemporary thinking, where every person is encouraged to think their own thoughts and make their own choices, so long as it doesn't negatively impact or cause harm to someone else. The problem then comes, though, with what people may consider to be causing them harm, or what another may consider to be harmless. This is all subjective and can lead to extreme individualism, where everyone chooses to do what is right for themselves without considering their impact on others. The slave girl was making money for her owners, and Paul brings a stop to this, thereby causing harm to her owners. But of course, Paul sees the great harm that is being done to the girl herself, and his frustration turns to compassion. But this compassion then impacts the livelihood of her owners. But these owners were driven by their own selfish motivations, with no particular concern for others, least of all the girl herself, whilst Paul's actions in healing the girl are driven by compassion. It is this compassion that Paul shows that demonstrates the power of the gospel that he comes to proclaim. In John 13, Jesus gives a new commandment, a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This love is not confined by labels. We are also taught to love our neighbours as ourselves, recognising that our neighbours are not the same as us. They may not share our interests, our tastes, our background. We are called to love one another, and it is this love for one another that should mark us out as those who believe in and follow Jesus. It's that love for one another that we want people to notice that will draw them in. I've been in a few churches over the years because I've lived in different places and if I look back, the churches that have been most effective have not been the ones necessarily with the big music groups and flashing lights. It's been the ones who genuinely care for one another, who follow one another up, who look after one another when they're sick. Those are the ones that have had the widest impact. Quite often, interestingly, they've been the smaller ones. The love is expressed through compassion towards others. So Paul, rather than impatiently waving the girl away, heals her, changing her life forever. Paul and Silas are challenged and punished publicly, dragged into the marketplace before a baying crowd who join in the attack, just as a crowd did before when they cried for Barabbas over Jesus. It's easy to be caught up in the crowd to find ourselves caught up in groupthink. Groupthink is described as, here we go, a psychological phenomenon that occurs within a group of people in which the desire for harmony or conformity in the group results in an irrational or dysfunctional decision-making outcome. Now that's a load of jargon to say that it's easy when you're in a group to start thinking like the group without thinking for ourselves and really digging deeply into what we believe. It's a lot harder sometimes to be the individual who says something different. It's easy to be caught up in these groupthink situations, which is why it's so important to pause and think about the decisions that we're making, to reflect on them from a Christian perspective with the help of scripture, to ensure that our decisions and behavior match our faith rather than the quick thoughts of those around us who may or may not share our faith. It's much harder to stand up and be different, to challenge injustice and speak out. Paul and Silas are publicly flogged in an act of deliberate humiliation and a public demonstration of condemnation. They are thrown into prison and even put in chains, kept as if they are the most dangerous and violent of criminals. The initial accusation was unfair, but the ensuing punishment 
it's far from proportional. So in finding themselves in such a difficult situation, how do Paul and Silas respond? What might your response be in finding yourself in such a situation? You can probably all think of much, much, much more minor examples of where an injustice is being done to us and how we felt and how we've chosen to respond. Is it despair? A sense that all is lost? Tears and anger? All of these would be understandable from human perspective. But Paul and Silas turn to worship, singing hymns and praying in front of all the other prisoners. Brings to my mind those well-known verses in Habakkuk about praising whatever the circumstances. Habakkuk 3, verses 17 and 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stores, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Perhaps we could mimic those own verses in our own lives. Though we're stuck in the middle of a pandemic that we don't quite know where it's going. Though people around us may be ill and struggling though our own circumstances may have their difficulties. Yet, I will rejoice, and it's like a deliberate intention and choice. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. This is not a flippant invitation just to be happy in all our circumstances, ignoring the very real pain that people are experiencing. There are people around us, maybe ourselves, going through some really tough stuff at the moment. There are people of faith around the world who face fear and uncertainty every day. This is not some glib invitation to sing worship songs and all will be well. Rather, it is a deeper invitation to be thankful, to recognise the blessings that we have, to be thankful for what God has given us, reminding ourselves that God has been faithful before and remains faithful and will remain faithful. We can do this through singing and prayer, or through quiet thoughtfulness, or a walk in the beauty of creation, surrounded by God's faithfulness and good works. It won't magically remove the circumstances we face, but it does increase our sense of peace through the knowledge that there is a God who cares for each of us individually and will walk with us through all our troubles. For Paul and Silas, they are singing in the face of fear and injustice and in front of others who are experiencing a similar fear, actually witnessing to others through their adversity and the impact is immediate. Through the faith of these two men who are still thankful to God when humiliated, chained and imprisoned unjustly, many others come to faith. Suddenly there is a violent earthquake, another cause for fear and panic. Yet Paul and Silas draw on their deep faith to have resilience and calmness in the face of this new and quite different challenge. The jailer has been told to keep a close eye on these prisoners and he's intensely aware of the repercussions if he fails. When the earthquake happens, his expectation is that the prisoners will have taken the opportunity and fled, and the jailer is prepared to kill himself because he knows that he's likely to end up dead anyway. The most normal behaviour, surely, for prisoners who suddenly find themselves free to leave, especially those in prison for an injustice, might well have been to flee, to get out of there, to go. But Paul and Silas stay put. <coughs> along with the other prisoners who have already recognised the courage and leadership in these two men. If Paul and Silas had chosen to escape, then they would have had to flee the town, never to return, and any impact they might have had in that place, or indeed other places, as they became fugitives, would have been lost. Paul and Silas in this moment have to choose to act counter to what their instincts might tell them as the greater things will be achieved through their choosing to stay. Immediately, the jailer is so impacted by their actions 
that he falls trembling before them and asks, what must I do to be saved? He has heard that message. He has heard the message about Jesus who has come and given his life so that people can come to God. The answer to the jailer's question is simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. No complex ritual, no steps to follow, just a simple act of belief. Romans 10.13 instructs us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. As simple as that. Paul and Silas are invited to share God's word with the jailer and all his household. The jailer's initial act of faith is to call on the name of Jesus. But then this genuine faith leads to a desire to learn more about this saviour and his teachings. The jailer responds to Paul and Silas with the same compassion that they themselves have shown to the slave girl and to the jailer himself, taking them to his home and bathing their wounds. He demonstrates that same compassion that comes from the very heart of the gospel, from lives that are profoundly changed by coming into contact with the presence of God in their lives. Whilst Paul and Silas protect the jailer through their decision to stay in the prison and then go with him to his home, there is still a case to answer. The following day, the magistrates send their officers to release Paul and Silas, to get rid of them quietly and quickly. But rather than just accepting their permission and going quietly, remembering, of course, that Paul and Silas could have already chosen to leave of their own accord, Paul and Silas now bring those officials to account. They remind them that they are actually Roman citizens with the same status and rights as those who have chosen to accuse them. In the heat of that earlier moment, with the baying of the crowd, Paul and Silas have been publicly beaten and humiliated without a trial, then placed in jail on no evidence. There is still this case to answer. Paul therefore demands that the magistrates themselves come and release them. Injustice needs a county. If Paul had left the jail, either when they found themselves free or when the officers gave them their permission, then this un injustice would have gone unnoticed. And Paul and Silas may have remained fugitives and perceived as guilty, or they may just have disappeared and been quickly forgotten. The magistrates, though, are now forced to come and appease Paul and Silas, telling them to leave the city now trying to play down the trouble that they themselves had hyped up. Paul and Silas, though, don't leave the city until they have met with Lydia and the household, the centre of the Christian community in that place, to encourage them and equip them, which is what they had intended to do. They don't leave the city until their task is accomplished. They're not going to be chased out by these magistrates. They are serving one who is greater than any earthly authority. No doubt Lydia's house and the gathered believers will have been considerably strengthened and expanded by those who had witnessed Paul and Silas's act of compassion and their willingness to worship in the face of adversity and God's faithfulness to them through their obedience to him. What huge impact that choosing to act in that way in such difficulties had. How Paul and Silas choose to respond in a range of situations demonstrates their faith to others, causing others to call on the name of Jesus and increasing the church. Are there situations in our own lives where how we choose to respond can have real impact? Occasions when showing compassion can bring transformation. Or times when choosing to speak out against injustice and to stand up for another can actually change the prevailing groupthink and bring about a more compassionate response? Are there situations in which we need to find a way to be thankful and even worship when all around us seems difficult or lost? God brought Paul and Silas through this latest challenge, even though it caused physical, mental, emotional and spiritual anguish, and their faith impacted others. 
God walks with us also, and even in the darkest times, can work in situations to bring transformation and glory to himself. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a faithful God. Lord, we thank you for those times when we can celebrate and be joyful, and when we can do that together as a family of your people. Thank you that there are some amazing times and times of joy. But Lord, we come to you in this time, in this time that feels, still feels tricky, where we're not too sure what next steps may be in all sorts of different ways and how they impact those around us and those we love. We've shared those in our fellowship who are really facing struggles at the moment. Lord, we pray that you will help us to stand for you. Lord, we thank you for your peaceful presence in our lives. We pray for those who at the moment are finding that really hard and we pray that they will find a time and a space to be able to reflect and remember your faithfulness. But Lord, help us to stand for you, to stop and to think, to reflect on your words so that our choices and our behaviours reflect you. So that others will see you reflected through us and our behaviour and our love for one another. Lord, help us to show that love in our everyday lives to each other and to those around us. And thank you for your ongoing faithfulness. Amen.